I think I've started to tell you, but I uh, got distracted from it. Is that the um, when GAO criticized? I told you they had crit- issued a report criticizing the lack of leadership from GSA and OMB on this subject, particularly on case management software. Meaning the leadership don't reinvent the wheel each time by prepackaged application software products. GSA's number two guy, the Reagan presidential appointee at the GSA, who was number two, this was like an 82 or something like that, early in the, in the Reagan administration. He wrote to the, the, the way that works, you probably know, when GSA does a report, they send a draft of it to any agency that they're criticizing, like GSA and OMB, and give them a chance to defend themselves, you know? And then they publish in the GAO report whatever these agencies write to them, you know? And so the, the number two guy at GSA said, we agree with the recommendation of GAO, but with an important provision. You, the software has to be engineered right from the beginning for ease of customization or the whole thing won't work. They said, such, just like Inslaw did with the Promise software. That software is capable of being used to track anything that's needed to be tracked in the federal government. So this is the presidential appointee who's number two at GSA somehow knows all this stuff, Mm. which tells you something, right? How does he know all of that? It's all true. But he, he knows it because he's seeing all of these illicit uses copyright infringing uses of our software being approved by his agency, GSA, through delegations of procurement authority. So basically they were using the NSLAW uh, uh, software in other departments and other agencies other than it was designed for and uh, licensed, I guess, by you. Right. Okay. Right. And the, the, uh, at at one point, Ed, um, Elliot Richardson one day introduced my wife and me to someone who was knowledgeable about uh, software being used for intelligence applications. And around, around what time was that? What year was that about? I don't, I'd have to try and figure that out. How old were you then, uh, around that time when you got that invitation? Because you were 30 when you designed the software. How old were you around that time when, when Richardson introduced you to this intelligence uh, information? Probably, probably in my 30s somewhere. Okay, you know? so not too many years down the road. Gotcha. No, and and um, I forgot where I was going with that. Well, no, but... the Richardson, he informed you that the, the software was being used for intelligence oh, gathering. Oh, what, what he, yeah, and, and he said... This is before I I knew anything about what they were up to, you know. And he said, Lockheed Aircraft in for a lot of money. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what? What the hell were they using the Lockheed Aircraft for? And over time, I found out that Lockheed Aircraft had a contract to develop the F-117 stealth fighter. And the contract was jointly funded by the CIA and the Air Force. And the Lockheed Aircraft Vice President in charge of the development of the F-117 Stealth Fighter later co-authored a book about the great success of the development of that F-117 Stealth Fighter. And particularly remarkable database software for the cockpit <laughs> which he, which the the author's name is Ben Rich and the book is called Skunk Works oh yeah I'm familiar with that which, book Ben Rich yeah yeah well he, he goes into some detail he, he claims that a couple of his engineers at the Skunk Works in Burbank California came to him up came to him one day and said we got an idea why don't we develop some sophisticated he may not use that word sophisticated, but it is very sophisticated. 
a database software for the cockpit that will guide the airplane automatically to minimize its exposure to ground fire and missiles and stuff like that and get it to where it's supposed to go automatically. And it went into great detail about it. Ben Rich did in the book. And he said it was so successful that the Air Force Systems Command in Dayton, Ohio, later bought a global license from Lockheed Aircraft to put it in the cockpit of every U.S. attack aircraft. <laughs> That's a lot of money, probably, right? Yeah, this is based on U.S. software. And Elliot Richardson, I guess he knew this information because he was a defense secretary at one point. He was, yeah. I mean, I don't think he knew it as defense secretary, but he, of course, was a very bright guy. And right. a lot of people... Um, respected him like we did. Did you have a and, relationship with him before you retained him to, to represent you? No, what happened was um, Rod Hills introduced me. Gotcha. To him. And uh, he, he, Hills said that we have to get, to get uh, an independent decision by the board of the not-for-profit that it has fulfilled its useful life and it needs to uh, be a for-profit successor company. This is because of the demise of that agency that financed everything, you know, the liquidation of it by the Carter administration. Right. And and uh, so he said, you keep, but you can't make that decision. You have to get independent directors. And so Hill's got Elliot Richardson and, and uh the guy who had been White House consul under Lyndon Johnson, I can't think of his name right now, a famous lawyer, another one, you know, and Cal Collier to agree to comprise the board of the not-for-profit and make the decision, which they did. It wasn't a difficult decision. Without LEA, you got to do something because there's otherwise you, the software will die <laughs> if you don't, don't find a way to pay for the inevitable upkeep and upgrade of the software now how, how are you so funding all this how are you funding this these legal fees so were they taking a, a percentage of the future uh, contingency or how are you funding no, all this no we we just we paid uh, we just paid for them uh, under our uh, operating okay. budget of the company <laughs> okay. and, and and none of them overcharged us at all, all right. they were all quite decent people, uh, Elliot Richards, of course, and Rod Hills. We're, we're very lucky to have such good people, you yeah. know, who are not uh, corruptible. <laughs> gotcha. So when did you first get wind that they were they had this back door in there and it was being used for intelligence? Is that the next next big point of the story? Um, I don't I don't remember anymore, Ed. I mean, there's so much that's gone by, gone on in this thing. So I, I can't, uh, at the moment, I can't um, think of when that would have happened. And the, uh, so I, I, I just, I, I'm not being uh, difficult with you. I just no, don't sure. remember. Well, would you feel better if we took like a half hour break or something like that? Or, or, or is there something no, else? Okay, no, then. I, I, I may not come up with it for days. Gotcha. You know? Well, I'll come back in days. Trust me. I, I want to hear this story. Okay, but but ultimately, you do start hearing that uh, uh, there was a back door and was being used for intelligence purposes. Uh, well, let me give let me give you a, an example of how of how we heard. Yeah, uh, that you'll find amusing. I think the at at one point. I get a. I was contacted by email and telephone by the official publisher of, of co the uh, the publisher of an official commemorative book for the 50th anniversary of the U.S. Air Force, and it was 12 months before the 50th anniversary that he contacted me, and he said, "What the." Com anniversary is about 50th year of the U.S. Air Force. And he said, uh, by invitation only, we'd like to invite Inslaw 
to uh, take out a full-page ad in the official publication. And he explained that Inslaw, Microsoft, and Oracle were among the largest software, the, the, the U.S. software vendors with the largest installed bases of their products in the U.S. Air Force. Inslaw had never sold it to the Air Force and never authorized anyone else to sell it to the Air Force. But he's telling us Oracle, Microsoft, and Islaw are the leading software vendors with penetration in the Air Force. Of course, that made no sense, right? Yeah. And um, then when after Elliot Richardson passed away, um, Admiral Murphy said, the first thing you need to do is get another outstanding lawyer like Elliot Richardson because government officials will regard it as their patriotic duty. This is Admiral Murphy talking to look Inslaw's lawyer in the eyes and lie. <laughs> <laughs> and so he introduced me to Judge William Webster, one of his friends, who had been the head of the FBI and the head of the CIA sure. under the Reagan administration. And three days after Judge, after um, Admiral Murphy and I had spent hours with Judge Webster, he called his friend uh, Admiral Murphy and said, I'm not confident that the George W. Bush administration is going to be willing to settle. And I'd have to be doing it on a contingency fee basis. Right. Because Insulin doesn't have any money. And it wouldn't be fair for me to do that to my partners if I have severe doubts the government's going to be willing to settle. You know? So he declined to do it. And so then uh, Admiral Murphy introduced Nancy, my wife, and me to uh, Boyd and Gray, who had been White House counsel. And um, when Admiral Murphy was chief of staff to Vice President George H.W. Bush in the Reagan administration, he had hired Boyden as the lawyer for Vice President Bush. And then Boyden stayed on as the White House counsel when George H.W. Bush became president. And so we, we, Nancy and I met with uh, Murphy and Boyden Gray. And Boyden says to Boyden Gray, someone needs to be the John Adams of the Inslaw case and represent Inslaw simply because it's the right thing to do. Will you do it, Boyden? And Boyden says, can I get paid? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so after the meeting, I said right away, well, we can pay you on a contingency fee basis. And because uh, obviously we couldn't pay him any other way, you know. And the um, so uh, Murphy and Nancy and I had lunch after this meeting with Boyden and Murphy was laughing. He said, you know, because I was chief of staff to Vice President Bush, I had to review and approve the financial statements of all the people who worked for Bush, including Boyden. And he says, he's one of the wealthiest people in the country. Yeah. <laughs> he's the heir to the R.J. Reynolds tobacco fortune. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he was find it amusing that he was asking, can I get paid? <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> I, wait, they, they even stiff you with the bill for lunch, these guys, too, when you go <laughs> with these cases right. sometimes, you know? So, uh, but Boyd yeah. did, did agree to, to uh, represent us. At, of course, he was kind of intimidated, probably, by Admiral Murphy's having hired him in the first place years earlier, you know. And, uh, it, and then Boyden got stonewalled by the government, just like Elliot Richardson did. You know, they they just lie. Right. And when we look because back in hindsight now, so yeah, we, illegal, when we look know? back in hindsight now, we can see these Freedom of Information Act documents, like the one about Bill Weld we were talking about off the air, where, they, where yeah. they're talking about $500 million uh, in sales through Khashoggi and being um, laundered and being walked through BCCI, uh, the Bank of International, there, you know. Um, so there, there was money out there, man, you know. The, where was oh, that yeah. money? Did you ever find out who got that money? Friends of the administration.